silver grey light of early morning and the stage is set for what promises to be one of the greatest feats ever accomplished by British pilots. Wind and visibility are both so good that already an hour ahead of time the tugs are slowly moving the Queen Mary away from the fitting out basin at the start of the most momentous, the most venturesome and certainly the most ticklish voyage of her whole career. Between this point and the sea lies 15 twisting miles of the River Clyde with a centre channel so narrow that if she swings more than a few yards off her course she'll strike the mud banks, and so shallow that at some points there'll be less than ten feet between her keel and the river bed. And as if all that isn't enough, there are three difficult bends to tax even further the navigational skill of the men in command on the bridge, the two pilots and Sir Edgar Britton, the Commodore of the Cunard White Star Line. And now at last her nose is pointing westwards, and slowly she moves forward to bid goodbye to her birthplace with planes roaring overhead and sirens sounding and close on a million people lining the route. And meanwhile the Pathé cameramen risk sudden death climbing to the dizzy tops of great cranes to get the pictures of this historic journey of the largest vessel that has and probably ever will steam down the Clyde. And from above more cameramen are looking down on the 1,018 foot length of this wonder ship of the British Merchant Service. Round the Dalmuir bend, speed is reduced to less than walking pace, and the tugs, like tiny smoke puffing gnats, push and pull the 80,000 ton hull into position. come aboard and share the view of those who were privileged to look down on the Scottish countryside from the Queen Mary's towering height. As she swings slowly round Bowling Bend, Sir Edgar Britton watches every movement from his outlook on the main bridge. With the veteran commander is Captain Cameron, the senior pilot, while the second pilot is on the after bridge controlling the tugs astern. Her future officers and petty officers are already at their posts, but her crew won't be commissioned until after she's officially handed over to her owners. As she passes the town studded along the lower reaches of the Clyde, she towers above the houses like a gigantic steel skyscraper. And so at last she reaches the open sea, and another Clyde-built ship has left her home to carry the name of Scottish shipbuilding across the oceans and round the world. and the sun sets as she lies at anchor off Greenock. She will not pass this way again, but to thousands of Scotsmen she will be a thing of pride forever. <laughs> 